Megan Afraid, it's like well known to be the hardest and most extreme reality show on television, and it's true. You just put one man and one woman out in the wilderness naked and give them one item each, film them and watch them try to survive. Making your own shelter, capturing your own food, purifying your own water. But again, it's kind of like raw in its simplicity and there's so much drama that unfolds when you're just, you know, being attacked by bugs and animals and trying to survive and not get hypothermia, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do when you come out as LGBTQ and love the outdoors? What do you do when you see the outdoor space ruled by older white cis men and desire a diverse community of outdoor lovers? Accept it, change it, create it. I am Justin Yoder, and this is LGBT Outdoors. Hey everyone, it's Justin here with the LGBT Outdoors podcast, coming to you from sweaty Texas right now with my co-host Patrick. Oh god. And um, <laughs> JC as well is back with us today. So we're excited to have him on where he is complaining about it being a hot 80 degrees in Colorado right now. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so what's up, JC? I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. It's been a busy summer. I There's just, it's hard to schedule things sometimes. And But yeah. I'm super glad to be back. I, uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm starting over almost. Starting over. You know how to podcast. <laughs> I don't know how to talk you, to people. You can. Do, I don't know. How to talk. <laughs> He's been out in nature too long. He doesn't know how to talk to people anymore. Um. <laughs> well, we'll get you back on track with that. Um. You were just in Washington, right? Yeah. Um. I did the half marathon in um, Mount Rainier. It was so oh, nice. pretty. Um, actually, I did a, it's called a Sasquatch double. You do a 5K on a Friday night and then um, half marathon Saturday morning. So by Oof. Sunday, my legs were dead. <laughs> I only had an, enough energy to, to to hit up the downtown area of Seattle and hang out with friends. <laughs> so no fun. extra hikes fun. or anything. Did a little bit of social. No, yeah. but it was good. It was good. That's great. It's pretty up there. Yeah, I'm excited. We have um, a couple new ambassadors that are coming on for Washington, so we're getting ready to blow that up up there. So anybody yeah. listening to Washington and want to get connected with our chapter up there, drop us a message and we would love to get you connected. But just to remind everybody, even though we've been talking about it a lot, we have um, LGBT Outdoor Fest coming up on September 22nd and the 20, through the 24th. So um, we've been talking about it a lot. If you don't know what it is, head to our website, LGBT Outdoors, and check it out under events. But I did want to mention that late registration is coming up and going to start on September 7th. So to get the best price, sign up before September 7th. Um, Patrick. Do you want yeah. to mention a couple staff updates for us um, to let people know kind of what's going on with LGBT Outdoors? Yes. So uh, coming off of Pride Month, we've had this explosive growth, which has been awesome and amazing and also terrifying. Um, so we brought in some of our uh, super duper awesome LGBT Outdoors ambassador heroes um, into new roles. Our ambassador up in New Hampshire, Cherie Belanger, um, is now taking over the LGBT Outdoor Ambassador Program. And she's uh, like interviewing and, and vetting all these new awesome people who are going to be leading local chapters, hopefully in your neck of the woods very, very soon. Um, we also have our Baton Rouge ambassador, um, Brody Metch, who is uh joining us as our lgbt outdoors event coordinator um basically um really helping to take a lot of stuff off of justin's plate so that um he can um continue growing and uh you know nurturing what has been built so far. So super, super excited and also grateful for Sheree and Brody for stepping up to the challenge. Also, our amazing, awesome uh, 
longtime friend and supporter of LGBT Outdoors, JC, is stepping into a new role sort of as an LGBT Outdoors ambassador mentor. Um, he'll be kind of hyping up the ambassador program through uh, some ambassador happy hours and kind of sharing best practices and great ideas and success stories to really get people uh, to get your local leadership, your, your ambassadors energized and pump up about uh, what they're doing and, um, you know, uh, how to do things better and, um, you know, looking at problems that arise in other chapters and all that fun stuff. Um, so well, we love JC deeply and dearly, and we are grateful not only to uh, have him uh, help build this with us, but also to call him a friend. Um, and he's totally here listening to all of this. Um, <laughs> are you and, doing all of this I, because I told you that I hate compliments? <laughs> it makes me feel so <laughs> Yes. Like, Thanks. I'm going to sit here um, and watch you be all awkward oh, and squirmy. Oh, my God. Um, well, I am super excited about this, um, be these changes. Um, as sad as I am to leave the director position, um, I've decided to take a step back a little bit to focus on my own passions. But in a way, um, I think this is this kind of brings a little bit of a balance for me because um, I, um, the ambassador program, the ambassadors within that program, they're in and of itself like a community. And I think in this new role, there's a lot of opportunities for me to bring them closer together. And um, that's something I'm super excited about. So the happy hour is like a quarterly uh, meet that we're going to have just to go over, like what Pratchik said, uh, best practices and um, uh, different ways that we can kind of engage the their you know the community um their own community and what's what's worked what hasn't worked in the past and it's going to be a learning experience uh so i'm pretty excited about that yeah i love it great things are happening super excited around here um if anybody's listening and you're like happy hour sounds awesome like um we are going to be doing virtual meetups too for um patreon members so jump over to our patreon and join that and support us and get to learn more about us as well but i'm super excited for today's guest um yeah, so same. i don't want to waste any more time and want to dive into this so our guest today is a marine biologist he has also been on naked and afraid seasons 10 and 12 naked and afraid xl season 8 and just finished up naked and afraid last one standing the first season so dan link welcome to the podcast Thank you all for having me. I'm excited to be on. Appreciate Absolutely. It. Glad you're here. Uh, we've kind of been stalking you from afar for a while on social media. And I think you've maybe follow us on uh, the socials as well. So um, I've kind of kind of uh, loved seeing your passion um, for the outdoors in, in many different aspects. But we are we're excited to share you with our audience and get to know you a little bit better today. Yeah, me too. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, jumping in, tell tell our audience who you are. Um, share with us about how you grew up, where you grew up, where your love for nature came from, and and like kind of introduce us to you. Oh no, big one. <laughs> uh, I, I'm originally from upstate New York. Uh, kind of like a, a smaller town outside of Rochester, New York. Um, I was raised by my, my godmother and, um, and my mom. It was a, a single mom. Um, my family wasn't really too outdoorsy growing up, to be honest. We would go on like hikes, which most people would probably consider walks um, in the forest, but they were great. An occasional camping trip and stuff, and stay in the tent and that kind of thing at a little campground. But, um, but, not too outdoorsy, really, other than that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. I grew up kind of like a weird, like, sticky kid, to be honest. <laughs> I, I was kind weird, of like... Weird, sticky weird, kid. Okay. Weird and sticky, <laughs> yeah. I just, like, be outdoors all day, like, playing in the mud and stuff like that. My grandma, oh, okay. like, as a little kid, would take me out to, like, this little cottage, this little, like, ramshackled cottage on a swamp and 
she'd take me out and taught me to catch frogs with her hands and stuff like that. <laughs> so, I remember it was like in, in elementary school, we were like going around like one day in class the first day and we had to like say one of our hobbies and it was like i like catching frogs with my grandma <laughs> and everyone laughed at me everyone laughed at me and i was like oh no does that <laughs> help with making Love friends it. or not making friends <laughs> no not at that point in my life anyway it did not <laughs> but i'm proud of it i'm proud of it um but i don't know i um yeah so it's kind of like unpopular in grade school to be honest but in um in like early high school honestly this is like a really big part of my life in early high school i started doing art like particularly 3d art like um like abstract ceramics and sculpture that type of thing oh cool and um it was it was really a transformative period in my life because i had a lot of success in it before that i really can't think of like anything that i was particularly good at i know that sounds hard frogs but, yeah, catching frogs with my grandma. I was good at that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, that was a big part of my life because I, ha I had a lot of success in it, like early in high school. And it brought a lot of confidence for me and like literally changed everything after that. Like I, I became all my grades started going up. I realized I could be good at things, et cetera, et cetera. And it, yeah, it really changed a lot. You know, I think most most gays out there have their English teachers that they were close with in high school. And I had my art teachers, Miss Toomey and Miss Lesky. I still talk to them all the time and they like come visit Hawaii. I live in Hawaii now no way. and I go see them when I'm in New York. Yeah. Yeah. They're great. <laughs> Love that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. But, um, but my mom and godmother were great. Um, I'm not going to go into whole, my whole family history because it's very complicated and weird. But um, they were great and awesome and very accepting and always like encouraged me to you know do all the weird stuff that I like to do. Um, I came out when I was fifteen, but before that, like I, I think I always knew I was gay, or not. I think I definitely always knew I was gay as long long back as I can remember. But um, so I was like always had it in my head like how I was gonna come out and stuff, and then. I have a half sister that didn't grow up with me, didn't grow up with me. And, um, I had only met her. I think I met her the first time when I was 13 and we'd see her, like she lived in a different state and, um, we'd see her like once a year. But then what, around the time I was, uh, 14 or something like that, or maybe I'd already turned 15. Um, she was going to come live with us with my niece and my mom and my godmother sat me down out on our porch. She still remember to this loop this to this day sat me down out on our porch and my mom said Danny your sister's coming to live with us we just wanted to tell you your sister's a lesbian she's coming to live with us with her girlfriend and then they sat for a second they're like how do you feel about that and I, all I said was that's fine I wish I wish to God I wish to God I had like come out right in that moment because it would have been a perfect story <laughs> but I did it. I came out. I came yeah. out like a few months after that. But um, but, but uh, that obviously made my coming out a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, sure. Yeah, but oh. they were both they were both super accepting. <laughs> my mom still, you know, had fear that I'd live a tough life, of course, understandably, especially at that time. Right. Um, but yeah. she was super accepting. Otherwise, I think that, like the one thing I heard her say once, or I didn't even hear her say, my uh, my best friend was uh a girl that I went to middle school with she actually still lives here in Hawaii and um her and my mom were like randomly driving around one day after I came out my mom like stopped the car and started crying and my friend was like what's wrong Mary Kay and my mom was like I it's fine that Danny's gay but I just wanted you two to get married and have babies <laughs> oh, <that's that>. oh. <laughs> <laughs> but but she was she was great and um my mom unfortunately passed away from um pancreatic cancer at 17 and um i've been mm. pretty independent since and my godmother not long after passed away from um passed away from cancer as well mm. um oh, wow. and you know a few years after that my uh close cousin of mine that i grew up with like a sister passed away in a an incident with a vehicle and um so yeah i was super 
super independent after all that. And it kind of just showed me, I think I was listening to your, some of your podcasts recently. I think one of your other guests was talking about this, but just showed me that life is not guaranteed. You know, I always already like wanted to go out and see the world and do weird things and put myself in uncomfortable spaces and that kind of thing. But it, I think all that like death kind of fueled that, you know what I mean? Showed you that, that yeah. it's fragile. Yeah. You only have one life to live. So live it yeah. out and proud and you're fullest, I guess. Make it good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I could only imagine how that much loss can help. It's how direct your life and give you more purpose. If anything's to come from it, it can definitely probably help fuel that aspect of it. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And make you, make you really want to live life to the fullest, like you said. Um, and you've been doing that. It looks like <laughs> I'm trying, um, trying. Uh, much well, to my body's dismay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You put your, you put your body through it for sure. Um, before getting to the show, I'd love to talk a little bit about, um, you being a Marine biologist. Cause you do that in Hawaii. And I imagine that that is, probably pretty fulfilling as well. But how did you get into uh, being a marine biologist? And um, what exactly are you, do you do with that in Hawaii? Which I would imagine there's an endless world there that you could go into in that in that field, in Hawaii especially. But I'd um, love to know like a little bit more specifically about what you're actually doing. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I I had all that success in high school with art and I got accepted into a whole bunch of fancy art colleges. And then at the last minute, I was like, I think I want to be a marine biologist. <laughs> <laughs> Living nowhere near the ocean. I've been there like twice. <laughs> like, I like to fish. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I'll be a marine biologist. Perfect. <laughs> exactly. All those Lisa Frank pictures in the 90s got to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those fabulous dolphins and exactly, I was stuck to color jumping out of a shiny ocean, a hundred percent. But yeah, I went to ended up going to school for marine biology at um, University of North Carolina Wilmington, and um, loved it. It's it's one of the coolest things like biology that you can go to school for, and science in general, at least if you're into that, because. I mean, it, 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 the pay is terrible. Warning to all the children out there. The pay is absolutely <laughs> awful. But, um, but, it, but it's super fulfilling. And going to school for that, like the best part of it is you're just surrounded by all these opportunities to go and do interesting and weird things. You know what I mean? Um, and you get a lot of collect nice. connections from that. And the connections and um, experiences you gain are honestly more important than your grades. But... Um, mm. But, but I love that, and I had an opportunity at one point to go work for a, a Hawksville Sea Turtle Protection Program on the Big Island in Hawaii, and um, volunteered for them for a little bit and came back, and I was a technician for a whole season and fell in love with Hawaii and finished my degree. I went and did the Peace Corps in Nicaragua for a little bit um, for uh, teaching science out there. It was my, um, my main project description. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, it was cool. But then I, I came back from the Peace Corps, moved to Hawaii, and uh, was looking for jobs. And it ended up being – I was looking for jobs everywhere. But it ended up being right after Trump was uh, elected but not inaugurated. And I was lucky that <laughs> – Trump to thank for my job. Um, because the conservation and science branches of the government – like. Do, did this massive hiring push right around that time. Because a lot of times, you know, presidents are inaugurated. They do a hiring freeze retroactive to their inauguration. And uh, so they did this massive hiring push before he came in. And um, I came in on that wave and I got my job. I work with the uh, Papahanaumokuakea, you know, it's a mouthful, but Papahanaumokuakea <laughs> Marine National Monument, which encompasses all of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, it's, it's a huge, it's the largest actively managed marine reserve in the world. It's around 540 something thousand square miles. It's absolutely massive. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's way bigger than all of the national parks combined, like double, triple that. Um, it's massive, but yeah, I, I love my job now. It's, it's a very, very remote monument. All the islands are extremely remote. Some of them take, uh, five days one way by boat. Uh, wow. to get out to yeah yeah so and it, 
for the like most robot? part with, like uh, five days yeah. on a boat oh, no. we would never i, I would never imagine. ever get there <laughs> robo you just drift out to sea right <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you like naked and afraid so uh right? <laughs> here you go um, yeah but but i love it it's, it's super challenging and all of the islands in the monument are sort of like their own refuge all of them are extremely remote you know the hawaiian archipelago is already the most remote archipelago in the world but these islands it's it's close to the public it's open to you know permittees and researchers and um native hawaiians and others that everyone that has permits basically um but permit process is a lot but i won't go into that it's not too interesting <laughs> but um but what was i going to say oh yeah all, all the other all the islands have their own unique um endemic species meaning they're found nowhere else in the world and they're like they're, some of them are tiny islands like in the double digits as far as acreage and some less some of the islands are transient disappear part of the years and come back but but most of them are their own endemic species found nowhere else in the world we're constantly finding new species that are are undescribed by science and never been seen before just found a new stale species recently um but and all of them come with their own problems with invasive species and other things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a it's a lot to manage, but it's it's really exciting. And I, I go out there. I big part of my job is coordinating logistics and organizing all of the remote expeditions. And I'll go out there and train other biologists and conduct the surveys myself. Um, and um, yeah, just go on these expeditions. But it's super remote. So honestly, half of my job is behind a computer like planning and coordinating and that kind of thing and putting together surveys and all of that. And um, the other half is, you know, getting to go out and experience these super remote islands. And, uh, and yeah, wow. I love it. I love it. I got my dream job. That's amazing. Um, you mentioned like finding new species and stuff. So that, that might fall into this, but what would you say like a couple of your highlights of your career have been so far? Oh, good question. I, the, the first one that pops into my head, honestly, is the first time I ever went into the monument, my first expedition. And um, I stopped at this island, which if you Google it, it's it's not the prettiest island in the world. It's called Turn Island in Lalo. Lalo is the Hawaiian name of the atoll or French frigate shoals. But the island's called Turn Island, and it was kind of built up by the Coast Guard and military. If you look at it from space, it looks like a big aircraft carrier almost. Um, but... It's got it's got like rusting sea walls and like buildings that are falling down and stuff. A couple, but but it's pretty small. And the but the what amazed me about it is because it was the first time I was ever in a bird colony. Like in any one square meter, there there are birds burrowing under the ground. There are multiple birds nesting on the surface of the ground. There are a thousand birds flying in the air. It just it sounds like something out of the birds movie. There's a, a conspiracy. <laughs> I don't know if this is true or not, but a lot of people say that this sound from the birds is actually recorded out there, but it's just like oh, wow. okay. the most like raw nature I'd ever seen in my life. And all of the animals out there just don't have, they don't see humans often. They have um, many of them have what's called kind of Island tameness. Like they, they don't experience predators or people. So they kind of really don't have fear of you. A lot of the juvenile booby species, the birds, we have like red-footed boobies, mass boobies, brown boobies. But a lot of the juvenile species or juveniles of those species are kind of curious and they'll just come like, they're big birds, like think maybe double, triple the size of a seagull. And they'll just, they'll see you walking around and be like, oh, something interesting to land on. And they'll go and like land on your head. <laughs> they'll land on your head and then you'll just like walk around doing your survey or whatever with a giant bird on your head. It, it's incredible. So like that, the first time I was out there, I think is like one of the highlights that sticks with me. Um, it's just, yeah, it, it's just like, I've never seen nature that sort of raw before. It's incredible. That's really wow. cool. What makes that island so popular with the birds? Is it just like a migration spot to yeah, land all, while migrating? All of, the, all of the islands in the monument have um, harbor huge bird colonies, massive, massive bird colonies, mostly seabirds. Um, though there are a lot of endemic land birds too, like finches and miller birds. But, um, but that one in particular, that atoll has a lot of little islands, but kind of like I was saying before, there are a lot of they're small and a lot of them are transient and 
Turn Island in particular, because it was built up by the military, and the entire toll is kind of the one most um, sort of permanent landmass, you could say. It's all in question now with sea level rise, but um, the one sort of permanent landmass, you could say, and for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. So that little tiny area has a much higher density of seabirds than, um, than the other islands, which if you've gone to the other islands and not Turn Island, you'd be shocked because all of the other islands have like, there are absolutely birds everywhere, especially during certain times of year. But yeah, just because of the, the remoteness of it and the, the limited land mass, I think. So if you don't like birds, <laughs> don't, oh, that, don't go there. that first time, that first trip I was on when we got to that island, as we were pulling up in the boat, literally the scene I was just thinking of in my head. They were pulling up in the boat. I was bringing out a vid- videographer as part of it to sort of um, film some B-roll footage for a film. This little girl, she could have been like more than her in her early 20s, little blonde girl. And we're pulling up and all of a sudden she goes, I think I have a fear of birds. And then I looked over and I started laughing. I started laughing and I was like, girl, you better get over it. (laughs) This is a really bad time to come to that realization. (laughs) Oh, my God. Few more birds than what she was anticipating, probably. (laughs) Exactly. That's hilarious. (laughs) All right. Well. Most people probably know you from Naked and Afraid. Um, if somebody is living under a stone and has no idea what Naked and Afraid is, uh, break that in and tell us what it is and tell us why you decided to do it, I guess, to start off with. Yeah, question. Naked and Afraid, it's like well known to be the hardest the most extreme reality show on television and it's true <laughs> i wish i could say i almost wish i could say any of it was fake but you don't get any help at all the basic premise how naked and afraid started was that they would put one man and one woman naked out in the wilderness somewhere and just it's kind of what made the show so, so successful because it's real because it's very simple you just put one man and one woman out in the wilderness naked and give them one item each and just Film them, just follow them and film them and watch them try to survive. Making your own shelter, catching your own food, purifying your own water, all of that kind of stuff. So it showcased a lot of um, survival skills, but um, but sometimes they put people out there with like less skills and stuff like that. And it, it, I don't know, it's, it's not necessarily always survival experts, but most of the time it is. Um, but again, it's kind of like raw in its simplicity and there's so much drama that unfolds when you're just, you know... <laughs> being attacked by bugs and animals and trying to survive and not get hypothermia, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. They do it all over the world and yeah. Dying of hunger <laughs> can be entertaining, but, um, and, and it's not sexual at all. Trust me. It's a lot of people ask that who don't know much about the show, but it's, it's not like a sexual thing at all. You have no desire. Your body loses all that desire when you go into survival mode. Plus you have, you know, ticks up your butt and you're covered in dirt and smell horrible. It's not like a rotting, <laughs> a rotting charred pig. Like it's, it's, it's bad. But, some um, people might be into that. I don't know. Some people might, I don't know. Oh God. <laughs> some of the messages I get sometimes they're like, wow, it's how you naked. And I'm like, it's literally the least sexy thing you could ever do naked. Trust me. <laughs> not, if you look at my Instagram, it's not cute. It's not cute. But, um, they branched off from that and did kind of like the XLs. I did one in the Amazon and how that works is normally it's like uh, four groups of three and your same premise. You're just out there naked surviving and eventually like you meet up and form a group and work and finish to the end. And it's, it's not really a competition. It's all about like kind of teamwork and cooperation. If you can handle that with your partner based on the way they people pair, they pair people up sometimes. But um. <laughs> one of the most successful reality shows on TV, honestly. And they just did a, they took all of like the best of the best from the XLs, people that finished it. And the one I did in Amazon was 60 days long. That was pure human torture. But, um, Jeez. but they took all the X, best of the best from those and put them on this new spinoff called last one standing. And they did make it a competition for the first time. Um, a little more drama in it. Not going to lie. We were moving around and we had to do like survival challenges, some of which were like skill challenges, some of which were eliminations and that kind of thing. Um, and for a prize of a hundred thousand dollars with just one, one person walking out. So yeah, I did a, I did a 14 day one in Mexico in a pine forest and then a 21 day one mostly by myself 
in a desert in the Chihuahuan Desert in far west Texas and 60 days in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. And then the last one, last one standing, um, it just finished airing recently, uh, was filmed in Aribi Gorge in South Africa. Amazing. How yeah. long ago? How long, how long ago was it filmed? Oh, yeah. You asked me why I did it in the first place. Good question. Um, it was the last one was filmed in um, September to November of 2022. But I did my first one about five years ago. I've done basically one every year. Um, yeah, I really didn't think of it too much before I started. Honestly, I'd like seen an episode or two. And then I was just like on a break at work, looking at my Facebook and someone posted a message from a casting person and said, if you or anyone you know wants more information on how to be on Naked and Afraid, send us an email. And I like literally didn't even think about it. I was just like, this would be funny. And I clicked it <laughs> and my email popped up and I like sent two sentences and my phone number. And they called me that day and I had like an impromptu hour and a half wow. long interview. And I got off the phone. I was like, that was weird. And then they called me again the next day. And then I had a few more interviews and a month and a half later, I was in Mexico for my first challenge. But my husband, wow. my husband at that time, or he's still my husband, but at the time he was like, <laughs> he was like, uh, David, he was like, you haven't thought this through. Like, this is dangerous. You're going to be <laughs> naked. It's, you're a professional. It's going to follow you for the rest of your life, blah, blah, blah. Like, et cetera, et cetera. And looking back, like literally everything you said was absolutely true. Like it was totally like a rash decision <laughs> and, and, and insanity on my part. I don't know how I thought at that point I could do it because I, I do. I mean, I like do a lot of outdoorsy stuff and backpacking and stuff, but like, that's like, Oh, it's a whole nother level. But, um, but he's, he's come around. He's, he's very, very supportive now, even though the challenges have gotten exponentially more extreme. He's just like, whatever you got this <laughs> yeah but now at least you're starting to get some money involved so he's he could be like hey this this right? could be uh beneficial yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. did you sign up already cool. for next year come on <laughs> <laughs> come on do it i'll email him for you yeah <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and like you couldn't have known when you're applying for the first one that you would go on to do multiple challenges like, you know, but uh, I'm guessing that, that there's something uh, that, that you get out of it that is like, oh, hell yes. Like I'm going back, uh, you know, after some like rest and recovery and, you know, <laughs> like re re rebuilding and uh, and all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. I mean it's becomes weirdly addicting in a way. And normally they, they put a lot of people on that show. The show is very successful and they've got a lot of funding and do a lot of the 21 day ones with new people and stuff. But um, I don't know when I first like took off from work to do it, I was like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I think I've used that <laughs> card up by now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. I never expected to like be good at it, let alone like come back over and over again, to be honest. Um, that that was a shock but you you do get a lot from it it's like pure human torture in the moment but i don't know it's almost as similar in like a a light way to backpacking i guess i could compare it to like anybody who loves backpacking like at any one point in time when you're out there and you're backpacking you're like my feet hurt and i'm uncomfortable and i stink and i'm hungry and haven't had like a cold drink and like like, you know, you're, you're uncomfortable yeah. sometimes in the moment, but like you still get so much out of it. Like you were the, comparing being in a lot of times a different country in an extreme situation, naked without food and hardly anything to, to backpacking. <laughs> I mean, like it's the closest, it's the closest relatable. It's a very light comparison. I'll admit, but it's the closest comparison I can make, I guess. to what like yeah. normal, normal people, normal, normal things people. people would experience. Yeah. But it, it does it like it changes your mind out there. I don't know if it's mm. the starvation or what, but like survival mode is real. You learn so much about who you are as a person and your life and your body's abilities is absolutely incredible. Like after a while, when you're out there after about like a week or two, like three weeks, you're really feeling it. Your brain changes and the way you think changes and like, yes, given you're like starving and uncomfortable and like have like mind numbing hunger, <laughs> you're mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. uh, apart from that, you're the way your brain works 
becomes simpler. I don't, I don't know how to like articulate it perfectly, but simpler in a good way. Like every, all of your thoughts are clearer. Like all of the fuzz that's in your brain, all the cobwebs that you didn't even, that you don't even realize are there on a day-to-day basis kind of get cleared out. You know, like I know like previous human civilizations weren't running around starving necessarily all the time, but I don't, like maybe it's just because what you have to do is so much simpler. Like at any point in time, you have a hundred things on your phone alone that you're trying to yeah. keep track of. You know what I mean? There's a thousand things in your life that you're like worrying about or thinking about and out there. There's a lot you're thinking and worrying about, but it's, it's much simpler. And again, all the, like the cobwebs go out of your brain and not only the calculations of what you have to do in that day to improve your situation, it's clearer, but the, like looking back on your life, and looking forward on your life and like what's important to you and what you need to do to get where you want to be and like professionally and personally, et cetera, like your brain changes. And I feel like as a scientist, it's sort of how your brain is meant to function. It feels much more like natural Mm. almost. And then I always experience, at least after the like 60 days and the 45 days coming back, like you always think it's going to be great. And it is great. You're, you're eating and you're sitting in a comfortable bed and you're around your loved ones. Can't complain about that, of course. But you do have this, at least I and a lot of other people get sort of like a, almost a generalized anxiety for a couple of weeks. It's kind of like the reverse of that clarity, like trying to like readapt to normal, quote unquote, normal society, you know, but suddenly uh, overstimulated. Yeah. Like lo- lots, lots of different inputs and you know like exactly. love like from from your family which which is awesome but i can imagine that like it's still a lot oh yeah to reacclimate yeah 100 percent. but yeah the adventure becomes kind of addicting in a way i think they always ask you like right after you're done in one of the final interviews like would you come do it again and i'm always like it's too soon <laughs> don't ask me that right now <laughs> yeah wait till i have amnesia in a few months or a year and then ask me again <laughs> Take your indoors, outdoors, or spacious skies campgrounds, a collection of 15 campgrounds and RV parks spanning the eastern United States. Each location is unique, but all offer the perfect escape to the great outdoors if you're looking to spend quality time with your friends and family or simply need a scenic home base for your nearby adventures. Choose from RV sites, cabins, yurts, retro RV rentals, or tent sites, and enjoy on-site amenities that offer convenience, creature comforts, and fun. Visit SpaciousSkiesCampgrounds.com for more information and easy online booking. We welcome and invite all campers to camp on with Spacious Skies Campgrounds. Like with how many times you've done it, have you come up with like your own personal tradition? Like, oh, I'm going to have a, a chocolate bar at the end of every every time I do this or... I don't know, something I something know. that you do for yourself to be like, you know what? Yes. I just did it. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, like after I learned this lesson after the 60 day one in the Amazon, especially um, you get you're so like mind numbingly hungry. Like It's just like in the back of your head, making you crazy. And you get like food anxiety hard. And like the simplest thing, like you're, you're thinking of extraction, you're thinking of leaving the whole time. And that last day when you get to eat and you're like, so paranoid in your head about like, when am I going to get the food? Am I going to get it right away? Am I going to get it a little later? Like, is the grocery store going to have this thing? Like, am I going to be able to find real maple syrup here in Africa? Like, is it going to happen? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> like, so after when I did the one in Africa or when I did the one in the Amazon, I had like so much of that food anxiety when I did the one in Africa, I literally packed my suitcase with like everything I craved in previous challenges, which I don't normally eat sweets, but you like crave sweets bad. So I had like real maple mm. syrup and Oreos and peanut butter and <laughs> chips and like nice. soy sauce and like cheeses and like all this stuff. Like I, and I had the opportunity to go to a grocery store too, but just like having all of that in my suitcase. I was like, during the challenge, I was like, okay, I know it's there. <laughs> I'll get to it eventually. <laughs> Waiting for I had you. Bottles, I had bottles of champagne in there. All, <laughs> all, all, yeah. Of course, you got to celebrate. Yeah, Did that make it harder at all, knowing like if you tapped out, like you had that available? No. It's weird when you're out there, even though you're so hungry, 99% of people out there love talking about food. 
you think it would drive you nuts, but uh-huh. it like makes you excited. Like gives it sparks joy. <laughs> like sit okay. around, you can sit around the campfire and like talk about food and recipes. And I swear, I swear on my grave, anyone that's a chef, there's any chefs or aspiring chefs out there, go out into the woods and do at least a 14 day fast. Like you think about food so differently and you come up with like these elaborate recipes in your head that actually like turn out to be really, really good. And like, as soon as I get out, you can't write things down when you're out there. You don't have pen and paper or anything. But as soon as I get out, I like grab my phone. And the first thing I do, other than like eating some stuff, is like go into the notes app and like write down all the foods and all the recipes that I've been thinking about. And then I make it my mission over the next couple of weeks to like make all those recipes and eat all those things. Wow, <laughs> oh, nice. that's cool. Uh, the, the closest I've ever got was a three day fast one time. And I thought that I was going to die during that. So I don't know. If I'd be very good <laughs> Why at did you have to do it? Um, For what? That's a long story. We can get into that another, is, another I'll time. say that's why I said go into the woods because it is different when you're like in in your normal life and living in your house and there's a refrigerator right there and stuff like that. Like I tried to do a, a fast before I went out in my first one, and I lasted about two and a half days, and then I had to go grocery shopping and I ate an entire Costco pizza in the parking lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that'd definitely but be me. It didn't last very long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um i'm uh warning our listeners right now if you haven't seen um last one standing i'm going to do a little bit spoiler alert but by the time this listens it's going to be a few weeks after it so if you don't want to know how it ends now's your chance to skip forward a little bit but um with that you came in second um congratulations on, yeah huge Thank congratulations you. that is so enormous um like and obviously if, if somebody watches the show that they'll see like what a monumental accomplishment th- that was um yeah. not only just sur- surviving for 45 days but but also in a deliberately competitive environment um when your resources are slim to none your energy is slim to none and like all that's driving you is your drive you know? yeah um so super, super impressive. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was intense. That one was a trip. <laughs> one of the things that like I, I've, I've seen a little bit. I think I know into your who you are by just our communication the last I don't know week or so, which I've just been blown away with. Just your your eagerness, your willingness, your kindness around coming on to the podcast and everything has blown me away. And then when we saw the ending, I, I told, I don't remember exactly what I said to Patrick, but I'm like, that represents Dan so well, because when it was was right. That ended up winning yeah. when yeah. he won, it would have been so easy because you guys are so close. It, it was so close. <laughs> When so he close. won, yeah, right. you could have been so mad or disappointed or angry or whatever. And you have the biggest smile on your face and run up to him and hug him and celebrate with him. And I'm just like, that doesn't surprise me. That that just seems like Dan from what I've the little tiny bit I've gotten to see him. And so like amazing. Like I think that speaks so highly of your character and everything to be able to celebrate because um I believe there is a one person that comes to mind that that would not have been their reaction on the show. <laughs> yeah, no, um, but wouldn't like, have been my reaction if that person won either. <laughs> 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 That's fair. Uh, yeah, no, probably not. But um, just to see you be able to celebrate with a friend like that um, was just incredible. So well done, well done on that. I Thank highly you. recommend anybody that hasn't watched that to go through and watch it. Um, so good. Um, and and um, like d- d- toward the end, as uh, one particular contestant uh, was on his way out, he was b- bemoaning the fact that he did everything on his own and that everybody else worked together as a team and in community. And I looked over at Justin and I'm like, but the people who work together are the ones who are still in the game. Yes. hundred percent. Like like that worked out not not only like just 
ethically um, is that better, but it is proven in the scenario of the game to be a more successful tactic. Um, yeah, at, I'm glad you at, said that. at least in this scenario. Um, so it was cool to see like kind of the the value of community and working together. I'm so I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, they. I don't think that's something I don't think they highlighted enough during the show. They were like, I think a lot of the production expected us to be a lot more cutthroat with each other. Yeah. But to be honest, be like being more cutthroat with each other in that kind of environment means you're like, you know, making someone get hypothermia or like starving them or something like that. Like it, it was a little inhumane, I thought. But to be honest, I'm, I'm so glad you said that and that you got that from the show because um, I don't think that was highlighted enough. Like working together, I don't, I don't think I necessarily went into it with a strategy per se, but like working together, it it was still a survival challenge at its heart. And sure. the heart of survival is like community and working together and pushing through those obstacles and sharing knowledge and resources. And it, it benefited absolutely everybody to do that. Um, except for the one person that didn't want to play that way, which is fine. They have their own strategy, <laughs> but it, it was a solid strategy in itself, like working together and being a community. It built literally everybody up. That's fantastic. So um, uh, another question that, that I came up with that I've always wondered this, and, and this goes across like all reality shows a, a, as a whole. Um, but do you have any regrets or were there any surprises to you personally when you were watching the show? Because like they'll do interviews of other contestants, which obviously you can't see. Um, you know, you're on the other side of, of you know, your, your area and, and whatnot. And you see somebody say something. Um, does that surprise you? Um, not really. I'm pretty proud of how I played the game. There's always, you know, like, um, well, I'm not calling out the editing department when I say this, but there's always like editing, and then you like they they they'll put in like a comment about something and you're like, Oh, I wish I'd like just talk to that person. So they wouldn't feel that way or something like that. There's, there's always some of that, but, sure. but I brought up how I played the game. And honestly, I, I was surprised that you, you think in a competition like this, you'd see more things on screen that really surprised you that you didn't know happened out there or that somebody else did or something like that. But we're all kind of like in the same general area and moving around and like, you have like no phones and nothing to distract you. You're just like talking about everything. So like there really gotcha. wasn't many secrets out there. Like you'd think okay. or too many people doing like shady stuff. But well, and like, I, like I was saying, like this is a monumental achievement and like a hundred percent and not out to, to cheapen that. Um, but you're, you're talking about editing, like, like at the core the, the producers are out to produce entertainment, like something that's dramatic yeah, totally. and, and and thrilling. And sometimes like you might have to kind of fudge a little bit of, uh, of drama or like, you know, creative editing, maybe putting something that somebody said like three weeks ago into a scenario that's happening in the current timeline. I guess what the question was about is if, if you see that and, and if, when you do, and you're like, now, wait a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that, that it's it's edited for entertainment, sure, and they go through a lot of different drafts. Um, especially on this one, though, that didn't happen too much. We like had to move constantly to different locations, so you're in a different environment and you're doing different things, and like people are leaving and eliminated, and it really kind of like diminishes their ability to like splice things around too much, True. to be honest. So, gotcha. Um, but but there's always some of that. Yeah, and in all of these, you know. You, like uh, last one standing, like they're trying to distill down 45 days of, you know, 12 people competing in the wilderness into maybe 20, 25 hours of content. Yeah. Like that's yeah. a whole Nothing. lot to squish together. So you're, you're going to have to lose some stuff. Yeah, exactly. Re regardless of what they want to show, it's inevitable that, you know, there's always the game of like, what did they show versus what they did, did they not show? You know sure. what I mean? That's always a thing. There's, there's so much that happens out there that you don't see. One thing that I'd really like for us to ch talk about is visibility and representation. Uh, you talked about representation a little bit um, on the show as well. When 
people might ask about your sexual orientation and stuff. And I know we get that a lot. Like, you know, we've heard all kinds of stuff. Like, what does it matter, you know, to have an LGBTQ related outreach oh, yeah. organization? Because like the squirrels don't care, you know, type of a thing. And of course we know the importance of visibility and representation. And we're working on educating people on that. Um, because if you think that there isn't a need for it, then you're part of the problem. <laughs> That's why we do need it. Um, but on your end, uh, from the show aspect of it, um, I feel like I probably know why, but for you, why is it important to have that representation there? Yeah. You know, I, I'm not going to lie. When I was going into my like first challenge, I really didn't think about that at all. Like barely, barely. I'm sure it crossed my mind, but I, I think, to be honest, in the beginning, I was almost, to to a certain extent, ignorant to the extent to which representation still matters. Um, mm. I, I never hid the fact that I was gay at all. Um, I always, you know, I'd just talk about it openly. It's just a fact about me. Um, my first challenge, my <laughs> they aired it because my I told my partner I was gay, and I guess her like boyfriend didn't want her to cuddle with other men. And, but I told her I was gay, and she was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> she was so excited. She was so excited. And we're, like, freezing to death out there in a pine forest in the rain. But anyway, I got a lot of messages after that first challenge, and I continue to after all of them, like, from all kinds of people, like, children and families in small towns and, like, family members that have, like, a, a little brother or someone that's coming out or something like that and, like, tell me how just my, like, simple representation change their lives in certain ways like mm. I, i'm not not like bragging about myself just saying like just the simple representation of a queer person in that kind of community like the the outpouring of messages and calls and all things all kinds of things i've gotten from each of them are absolutely mind-blowing like after mm. the amazon i got this one message from a woman who said her um, just reading one of the hundreds, to be honest, like she said, her grandson came out and was gay. They live in Arkansas at 13. And, um, he wanted to join this, like, uh, Boy Scouts type group, not Boy Scouts or something like that. And he was really nervous how he was going to be like judged or accepted. But then he ended up like seeing the show and joining that group and like built this really big community for himself. And then his brother passed away like a couple years later. And like that community is what like, kept him thriving and it just, mm, just things like that. Wow. The simple fact of representation, again, I really didn't even realize how much the extent to which it was impactful, but I guess maybe I just like live in a, live in a nice bubble now, unfortunately, but it, it was just so impactful to see a queer person in this community. That's, you know, it doesn't have many like marginalized minority communities or really like, not many people that aren't in a cis straight white male, um, to be honest. So just to see something like apart from the norm and see yourself represented in that, like it changes yeah. lives. Representation is huge. Yeah. So on all of my challenges now, I've, um, after that first one, I've told them like, and I've told like the, um, post the editing team later, like, please make, make a mention of that. Like, make sure that like, comes in the show at least once or twice or something like that like yeah, so they they and they told me each time they're like we weren't going to talk about this but like tell me why it matters and then so yeah I, i'm i'm happy with the editing they, they put kind of a monologue at the end of the amazon um that was a big one and um i think they, they made mention of it the last at the end of last one standing too but yeah well, and you're out there, like, and it's not just representation from a queer person. Like, it's a queer person who's out there, absolutely kicking ass, um, like doing like uh, you know the damn near impossible, um, and, and really, really like not just rep representing, but representing well, um, and, mm -hmm. and cutting down those stereotypes uh, that we we tend to face as a community. And like, I I thought it was awesome. Um, just to get that platform and not really making it a thing. Um, but, but you, you got your moment th toward the end and, um, um, uh, you actually mentioned that you liked being underestimated. 
And I found that really, really interesting. What, why is that? Yeah, I, I do like being underestimated to a certain extent. I mean, yeah, being underestimated, obviously, in many situations has like some real world negative impacts. I'm not, not denying that um, at all. But it, especially in these outdoor situations and sometimes even in work and stuff like that, like, I'll see fans in the beginning commenting like, oh, he's gay, he's not going to make it, blah, blah, blah. And and I'll, I'll be underestimated other times. Maybe it's like partially because of my sexuality. Maybe it's partially because when I'm out on these naked and afraid challenges, I'm always the one like, I'm out there with all these like quote unquote alpha dudes that are like, I got this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm always like, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> like, this is fun. <laughs> I'm just figuring it out. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, so probably a combination of the two, to be honest, but, but I like when I'm underestimated because it's like almost a challenge to prove them wrong. And when people are like uncomfortable in a certain definition of that word or underestimate me, I like to see the transformation of people where they're like, oh, wow. Okay. He did it. Like a, a queer nice. person did this thing. Like didn't expect that. And you'll see some people on social media will comment all the time. And I actually like these comments in a certain way they're like wow you're a gay i didn't think you were gonna last long at all i thought you were gonna tap right away but look at you now <laughs> thanks man i guess like, exactly <laughs> is that like a backhanded compliment <laughs> right um yeah we love that yeah. we love breaking down stereotypes in our community because like so many people are like gay people don't like the outdoors and it's like yeah we do like right like so I, I like the i think in the intro of your show you say accept it, change it, create it. And I loved it when I heard your podcast for the first time and heard that. I was like, I think the change it part is what I identify with the most. So when you're, when you're out on these challenges too, it's not just like what the public see. Um, but when you're out there, you know, you're with all of these people who are from totally different walks of life. And especially as, you know, like a stereotypical queer person, you know, like I have my like normal kind of bubble of like people I hang out with in my normal life and that kind of thing. And out there, the people are like totally different. Many of them are, and I'm not trying to talk negatively about them. I love these people to death. I consider them my family, but many of them are like far right in politics and I'm like, definitely not. But you form these deep, deep relationships out there with, again, people who are totally opposite from a normal bubble, like thinking, think like you're like a small town biological family, except, much weirder and more eccentric and you're much closer emotionally and you're much more naked <laughs> and you're all you're all trauma bonding together and mm. like the guys and girls that i've been out there with on these challenges were like tight and we'll we'll talk about anything like we know all the most intimate details of each other's lives but again many of them are like pretty far right and one of them in particular like we had a conversation on one of the challenges um and he, we were talking about like sexuality and the queer community and like verbiage and all this stuff. We had like a three day long conversation because there's nothing else to do. But like mm. in the beginning of the conversation, we like started off with basic words. He didn't know if it was all right to say the word gay. Uh, so we went, we went from there. And, uh, so, so ground level. From there. Yeah, we started at the ground level and we moved on from there. But um but it's been interesting, like really getting to know all these people with different political perspectives and stuff like that in such an intimate way. Cause I don't know, for me, even before these challenges, you know, it's all about intent. Like if you're intending to cause harm with your words and having mutual respect. And if, you know, you can meet those things, you have good intent, you have mutual respect and you, you can have a conversation about pretty much anything. Like, I don't think the word ignorant should be a bad word. I think, ignorance is fine we're all ignorant to all kinds yeah. of different things like i'm i was ignorant to a lot of the things that we're talking about on their side to be honest and saw some new perspectives and grew that way but um yeah i don't know it's just just fascinating and the conversations i've been able to have with them because we had respect and i think it really changed their perspectives and even on social media i know people say ah oh, you can never reason with someone on social media but like after the show, you know, I, I think I've gotten like a certain degree of respect and stuff like that. And I'll get all, all kinds of comments, like some a lot of them that are like, 
homophobic but not intending to be blah blah, blah. and like mm-hmm. i think because they like see me on tv and have respect i've been able to even like just have conversations with all kinds of people and change their perspectives and i don't know i think just like being on the show changes the perspective as well to a certain degree but he's like i'll get messages like i don't know why he brought politics into this when i like have the like mentioned being gay or something and I always, always tell all these comments. I like, I type out a petty response. I'm like, I'm sorry, my existence offends you. But, <laughs> but, but then I, then I delete it. All, almost always, I delete it. Not always, but mostly. And um, I'm able to like, I don't know, re- reach a lot of these people and have these conversations in a way I don't, I think is, it's, is really unique. You know, like mm-hmm. I'm in a situation now. I've realized like just fairly recently that. I kind of, I have this big platform on Naked and Afraid now and Naked and Afraid, like it's not like, it's not the thing that the queer community is watching for the most part. Maybe so. Again, it's the least sexy thing you can do naked, I promise. But (laughs) it's like mostly middle America. So I have this really interesting perspective and platform into middle America as a queer person, which, you know, a lot of like, LGBT groups, like the outdoors ones aside, you know, kind of exist and communicate sometimes in sort of an echo chamber. And I have this like weird platform that's like totally outside of that echo chamber and it's in middle America. Uh And I'm still kind of like trying to figure out what to do with that. I swear anytime I I have like a lot of followers now, but just from the show, but anytime I like post something gay, I'll lose like a hundred followers, which is fine, (laughs) which is fine. (laughs) But, um, which is like interesting because y- you being vocal about being gay on the show um, and them following you, I'm sure a lot of them, because of the show, um, followed you having that idea that you you are gay. Yeah, I'm sure the vast majority did. Some might see like parts of episodes or parts of seasons and not know, but yeah, but yeah, I don't know. It's like a position that I'm still learning how to like harness. It's interesting. Well, like I'm grateful that you're aware of your platform and uh, just getting a sense that you have the intent to use your platform for good. Um, I I think it'd be very easy for anybody who who gets any sort of like following and popularity to be like, yeah, look at me. I'm awesome. Yay. Woo. Um, But like you're doing good with it. And I think that, that that's important to to note. Like that, that's a big deal. Um, yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me on your podcast. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. There's a lot of education that goes into having a platform, like what what you have done, and as well on like on our side, you know, like, and we know that you've gotten a lot of hate from it from looking at your Instagram as well. So <laughs> that's. Uh, that's something that's always fun to deal with. We had to deal with that a lot during Pride Month, um, especially working with some of the national parks in post. And it's like, not to dive into it too deep because we have in, uh, I think, a podcast last one or two ago or so. But, um, you know, like a national park ranger had a, a flag that she was holding up and they made a post about it. And all of a sudden, all the hate shows up and getting comments about like, why are we sexualizing the, the a national park? And it's like, right, it has yeah. nothing to do with like sexualizing right. a park. Like, come on. So I, I will say too, though, like of all the like hateful things you see, I had kind of this conversation with um, a friend of mine, a trans girl that did make an afraid. And she got um, a lot, a lot of hate from it. But mm. I, I told her, and it's similar to the, to what you're saying now is like, because I learned this lesson through the other challenges, like of all the hateful comments you're getting, you're in affecting a thousand other people's lives just by yeah. like having that representation and having that visibility. Yeah. And, and sometimes when you get those messages too, going back to what I was saying earlier, like I'm sure like with a, a queer outdoors group, you know, you, you experience this kind of thing a lot. Like back to what I was saying about the comments on social media, but the same when people are like saying these things in person too, a lot of times they're just being hateful or like sometimes they're just trying to be hateful or like instigate something. And like, that's probably not worth dealing with for the most part. But again, sometimes there, people are just like coming from a point of ignorance, which I don't think is a bad word, 
and they don't intend to be f f offensive. They just don't really like understand. And if you can, if you can identify that and like put away the urge that I have to be petty sometimes, if you can <laughs> identify that and like see their intent and have a conversation with like mutual intent and respect again, like a lot of times, a lot of those comments you see that are offensive are just people not getting it. Like, and they're open to having a conversation. I think, you know, we always say, ah, it's never worth like arguing with someone on social media, but, um, but the same goes for life. Like sometimes it is, sometimes that's what you have to do. Yeah. I love that. That's great. Uh, Patrick or JC, do you have any questions or thoughts in, uh, as we start to wrap up? Um, uh, I've got one, like, so, um, say in last one standing, um, it is day 45 was jets away in the helicopter and, and you are done. What's like, what's the recovery process like both like physically and mentally? Uh, it, it obviously takes a toll on both. Um, Oh, it does. Yeah. <laughs> which uh, ooh, like sidebar real quick. Um, on the next to last challenge, when you got fire and y you had finally gotten there, the look on your face uh, of like a, a mix of relief, but also joy. And just, it was this really beautiful moment of like raw authenticity uh, about this, how excited and it really, really stood out to me. Like that was a really, really cool moment. Um, I, I know that that was a struggle, but that, that was, it was a really beautiful, beautiful moment. Yeah. I couldn't wait for that scene to air on TV. I never <laughs> thought you told me I would have that much emotion over, uh, making the fray challenge. I would tell you you were crazy before that happened, <laughs> but yeah, we had to do that friction fire challenge. Uh, starting like 42 days after being out there it's like a month and a half and you're already you know starving and depleted and i was skinny as hell i looked like a goat that had taken all the skin off it was just like muscles and tendons and veins <laughs> it was crazy the big crazy beard smelling nuts but um but yeah you had to like sit out in the sun and just like do something over and over again and fail at it over and over and over and over again and you're like baking and depleted so by the time like i actually got it i was yeah genuinely shocked and filled with emotion. I was crying. I burnt, they didn't show it, but I like, I burnt my eyebrows and my eyelashes and like all of my hair off <laughs> by accident. Cause I was like so excited about starting the fire and I had so much adrenaline. I'm throwing all this stuff on even when it's already huge. And it like the fire like came back and like burned all of my hair off basically. Oh, wow. And I didn't even notice it until like a half an hour later. But, um, but yeah, no, that, that was insane. But the, the recovery process afterwards is a lot. Like I was already talking about like the emotional recovery, like you have anxiety, just like generalized anxiety. But you also have after the longer ones, after the 60 day one and the 45 day one, you have this period where you still have the food anxiety. You think you're going to like be home and you're going to be like loving all the meals and stuff like that. But at least for me, it's like not like that for a two week period. It's actually kind of bad because you're, stuffing yourself with all the food you possibly can till you're about to puke or you do puke. And then <laughs> I know this sounds awful stuffing yourself constantly. And then once you're at the point where you're like, you're not going to puke and you have room for like another bite in your stomach before you puke, you're like run to the refrigerator and grab a block of cheese and just take a whole bite out of it. Like, it's just like anxiety <laughs> binge eating for like a couple weeks rather than like, you don't build up the hunger to like go out to dinner and enjoy a meal. <laughs> So that's a lot. Um, physically, though, yeah, like you're covered in like sores and scrapes and all kinds of stuff. And that takes a while to recover from. A lot of people have like injuries and broken bones and stuff, to be completely honest. And it takes about like as long as you're out there to recover physically, like the 21 days took like roughly 21 days to recover. 61 day one took 60 days to recover, except for your hair. Like from the longer ones, about um, say like three months after getting back from the challenge, like male pattern baldness came in hard. Like all the hair on the top in the back of my head, like started thinning rapidly, and I could like wow. see through it and see my scalp in the mirror, and like my hairline was receding. And I was like, "Oh God, I'm not ready for this yet." It, like happened violently. <laughs> 
so quickly. Um, but then again, about like three months after that, it all starts coming back too. So cool. And th- th- uh, that's just like a back. nutritional deficiency, you think? Yeah, just from malnutrition, hundred gotcha. percent. But all kinds of weird things happen with your teeth. It's it's hard on your body. Your uh, body just like so that like very long fast. Your body like resets itself in weird ways. Some of which are good, but someone yeah, had their teeth fall out. Like Stephen did. Was, yeah, yeah. That was impressive in a bad way. But like, yeah, I, you hear I me think in that, that you scene. That it's malnourished Steven's, that fast. Stephen's tough. All those guys are tough. They, like, yeah, they die are. before they quit. But yeah, you hear me in that scene when his tooth fell out. He's just like casual in front of a diary cam and pulls his tooth out, and I'm like. Did your tooth just can fall out? <laughs> They're all like, especially the guys I was with at the end of last one standing. Stephen was one of them. Like, they're all tough mother effers. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if I can swear on the podcast, but sure. you they're can. tough as hell. Sure. They're tough yeah. motherfuckers. It, it like, unlike anything I've ever seen before. You'll like, you'll see me at the end. I don't think they ever highlighted it for some reason, but you'll see us in our camps at the end and like, it got down to like 39 degrees at night sometimes and it would rain all the time, like two out every three days is miserable. And I would like build myself this like whole elaborate shelter over the top of myself. I'd have this whole bed that was like eight inches thick made of grass. And like, and then I'd pan over to them and they're bragging about the rocks that they're using as pillows. And they'd be like, I have the better pillow rock. I have the better pillow rock. And I'm like, you guys are delusional. You're using pillows as rocks and bragging about it. Get a cup of grass. Like, what are you doing? But love those guys. You're like, <laughs> tell nuts. yourself what you need to tell yourself to be able to try to get through it. But like, I need some there's... beauty sleep. I don't know how y'all are functioning. There's some but... softer options here. That's <laughs> yeah. funny. I did have to become at one with the kicks to have a grass bed <sighs> like that. But other than that, it's a lot. JC, you have any uh, final questions or thoughts? I oh, know I'm good. It's just been good to kind of take it all in. Yeah. yeah. Are you ready to do it? <laughs> People that are listening what? can't see JC's ex- facial expression. <laughs> 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 to go on, on naked and afraid. <laughs> No. <laughs> oh, man. No. I don't know. I think you could do it. Well, what about you, Dan? Do you uh, have any aspirations to do another challenge? Yeah. I'll be out again, I'm sure, one way, shape, or form. I don't know. I feel like I need to give my body a little bit of a break right now. But. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, yeah, I'll, I'll get out there, whether it's on Naked and Afraid or something else. Like, yeah. Awesome. I'm not done yet. Yeah, that's cool. After uh, after doing as many as you have, I feel like, and I think you mentioned this earlier, it kind of becomes addiction, and you, it'd probably be hard just to quit then. Um, so for you, Dan, wrapping up, do you have any um, any final thoughts or message that you would like to give to our listeners? Um, yeah, again, I think going on what I was saying earlier, like. To the extent possible, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're underestimated or like even if like your existence or the fact of your sexuality is making some someone uncomfortable, don't hide who you are to the extent possible. Sometimes you have to, but don't hide who you are if you can, you know, mm. have grace and have fun with it. You know, when, as I was saying, you know, when someone's uncomfortable, I think that often means that they're growing as a person inside, like mm. let them underestimate you and then. Have fun proving them wrong. Again, easier said than done, and sure. you can't always do that. But yeah, it can have a. It, it, you can have fun with it at the same time. You can turn that into something positive. I think can cause cause change from that rather than letting it bring you down. I love it. That, that's some. That's great. Yeah, Brene Brown level uh, wisdom right there. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Um, where can our followers uh, follow you, our listeners follow you at, or learn more about you? Yeah, I have a, a Facebook page. It's uh, Dan Link dash Naked and Afraid, but I'm probably more active on my Instagram. On Instagram, I'm at Dan underscore Link underscore Survives. Yeah. Awesome. I'll it, be posting all of my adventures there. Sweet. Like I said, I look terrifying because it's mostly Naked and Afraid stuff. So I look like a a crazy <laughs> hobbit, but <laughs> probably not always like that. <laughs> we'll have links to all that stuff in our show notes. 
Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Again, great. I appreciate the opportunity to come on. It means a lot. Thank you for hanging Thank out you, with Dad. us. And and yeah, thanks. congratulations thanks again. Sharing. I like such a big deal. I, I, I really you. hope yeah. that you're proud of yourself. That's awesome. Thanks. That means a lot. Yeah. All right, Dan. Thanks so much. We uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future on more episodes, hopefully, or who knows where you'll be popping up. But um, keep doing what you're I'll doing. Be around. You're make you're <laughs> making a difference out there, and we're excited about that. So um, thank thanks you again for joining us. Uh, to all of our listeners, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you so much. Uh, if you want to learn more about us, check us out on the web, lgbtoutdoors.com. We'd love to be able to connect with you. And until next time get out there. Thank you again for joining us this week. If you have a campfire conversation story you would like to share, please email it to us at info at lgbtoutdoors.com. Follow us on Instagram at lgbtoutdoors and join the community at facebook.com slash groups slash lgbtoutdoors. Become a partner by joining our Patreon where you gain access to monthly bonus stories and exclusive content. For more information on today's episode, check out the show notes. For information about LGBT Outdoors, LGBT Outdoor Fest, local chapters, or to sign up for our newsletter, visit lgbtoutdoors.com. And if you're enjoying the show, please rate, review, and follow wherever you listen to podcasts. Mm-hmm.